Um, I'm Jenny Rismersky, and um, I have the great pleasure and actual gift of having Barbara on the campus um, to speak with us. I've known Barbara for a number of years, and the entire time I've known her, she has been a fighter for a cause. And it's been a variety of different causes, but I can tell you that within the last few years, electronic voting has consumed her life. She has uh, taken this on with uh, all of her energy and is traveling all over the country. As I looked at her resume, I want to tell you I had the, the feeling of and the question of myself of what have I been doing with my whole life uh, when I look at the things this woman has accomplished. So let me tell you some of those things. Dr. Simon is uh, co-chair of the Association of Computing Machinery U.S. Public Policy Committee, which she founded. She is uh, past president of ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, which is the largest um, international association of uh, technical people, I believe, in the world at this time. Uh, she was a member of the National Workshop on Internet Voting, which was convened by President Clinton. She participated in the Security Peer Review Group for the U.S. Department of Defense's Internet Voting Project, SERVE, and co-authored the report, which ultimately led to the cancellation of serve because of security problems. She's a fellow with ACM and with AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She received the Alumnus of the Year Award from the Berkeley Computer Science Department, the Distinguished Service Award for Computing Research from the Computing Research Association, the Norbert Weiner Award for Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, and she was selected by C CNET as one of the 26 Internet visionaries. And uh, also a top 100 women in computing by Science Magazine. Um, she is, as you can hear, um, active in all of the major associations that deal with issues of privacy, electronics, uh, technology, uh, public policy. She's on the board of uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center. She is on the board of directors of UC Berkeley Engineering Fund, Public Knowledge, and the Math Science Network, as well as the advisory boards of Oxford Internet Institute, Zero Knowledge, and the Public Interest Registry. So she's on boards all over the place. Uh, Dr. Simon earned her PhD in Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley. Her dissertation solved a major open problem in scheduling theory, and in 1980, she became a research staff member at IBM San Jose Research Center, uh, which is now called Omega. In 92, she joined IBM's Application Development Technology Institute as a senior programmer and subsequently served as senior technology advisor for IBM Global Services. And I just have to tell you what her main areas of research are, because I can read them but I have no idea what they entail. Um, she, her areas of research have been compiler optimization, algorithm analysis and design, and scheduling theory. I know her as a very staunch advocate for public policy and privacy issues, and it is my pleasure to have her as a friend as well, Dr. Barbara Simons. Well, let's see, I've got it. Oh, it's on. Right? Okay. First of all, I have to say that IEEE would probably be upset if you said ACM was the largest technical society. <laughs> but uh, if you qualify and say computer scientist, that might work. Um, also, I should say I have not been doing research for a few years because I've been focusing on public, on technology policy issues. And uh, voting, really, for the past two years, it's just taken over my life. So a couple of quotes which I like. Um, I believe this is Stalin. I've sometimes heard that it might have been somebody else. But those who cast the votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. And then this one I know is Teresa Lepore. We always pray for large margins. Um, the, the, infamous, the designer of the infamous butterfly ballot, who I'm happy to say was defeated recently in election, although she will be running the election, uh, the 2004 election. So why are we talking about all this now? Well. Florida 2000, of course, caused people to wake up and say, oh my goodness, 
elections aren't going quite so smoothly as we thought. Votes aren't, there are problems with votes being counted. Uh, but some of the wrong conclusions were reached. Um, organizations like the League of Women Voters felt that what, what, what the Florida ballot recount said was you can't count paper. And I think that this is, was a very naive conclusion to have reached. Uh, we count paper all the time in this country. Banks count paper. Racetracks count paper. Other countries count paper ballots. You can count paper. One of the problems with Florida is they, didn't, they hadn't counted paper for many, many years. They hadn't counted ballots. Uh, New Hampshire does recounts all the time, hand recounts of paper ballots. They know how to do it. In California, there's a, one, a mandatory recount of 1% of the ballots randomly selected. In California, people know how to count paper ballots. In Florida, they've been avoiding it assiduously. And they just recently tried to avoid it again by passing a law saying that you can't do recounts of electronic voting. Uh, well, there are questions as to whether you can or not anyway. But basically trying to avoid any kind of recount. And that was thrown out by the courts. But, but the problem is they didn't know how to count them. And you know this image of people holding this up and looking in the light, that's not, you know, there were a lot of problems with what they did. There were another problem with Florida, of course, is that the Chad trays hadn't been emptied in some of these areas. Coincidentally, quite a number of them were African Americans voted. I mean, in California, we were using the same kind of ballots. We didn't have problems like they had in Florida because the machines in California were well maintained, certainly where I voted they were. And so if you don't empty the Chad trays and you try to punch a hole, obviously sometimes it won't go all the way through. So there were a lot of problems with the voting in Florida. Um, I'm not really going to talk about it, but another one which I mentioned, uh, which Jenny didn't know about, is that between 50 and 100,000 African Americans were taken off the voting rolls in 2000 uh, on the grounds that they might be felons. I mean, the, the idea was to purge the list of felons. Uh, they were using a list of Texas felons, and they were purging Florida voters. And anyone whose name was anywhere similar to a name on the Texas list got purged, including some people who held elected offices went to vote and found out that they were no longer on the voting rolls. Um, so uh, I want, and just, just another little tidbit. These are things you learn when you work on electronic voting. The whole idea of, fel of felon disenfranchisement is really an outgrowth of uh, Southern efforts to prevent African Americans from voting. That's where it started. It started, I think, I'm not sure if it was Reconstruction, but it started in the South, along with some of the other, uh, the poll tax and the literacy test and so on, that were used to prevent African Americans from voting. So that's a long digression. Uh, anyways, the result actually of Florida 2002, uh, when they again had problems, and believe me, they're going to have problems in 2004 as well, uh, the Help America Vote Act was passed by Congress. And this act allocated almost $4 billion for new voting equipment. Um, and part of the law is that, that punch card and lever machines were supposed to have been replaced, I think that maybe by two. By, yeah, by 2004, but people get waivers till 2006. And NIST was charged with setting standards. Unfortunately, no money was allocated for NIST. As a result, we had a gold rush mentality where there was all this money on the table. The vendors said, here, buy our products. The election officials had no guidelines. And um, furthermore, one of the secrets, which isn't talked about very much, is that there um, the election officials and the vendors uh, have a, a very close relationship in many cases. And certainly, when you start talking about these electronic voting machines, in many cases, the election officials depend on the vendors to help them. And, and you go to meetings of election officials, and the vendors are there wanting and dining them. So uh, there are, I've had the feeling, as I've been involved with this, and I think a number of other computer scientists have too, that we're sort of walking in the woods and kicking along rocks, and you kick a rock, and you, and you turn it over, and all these little, little creepy crawlies come running out. There's a lot of stuff that no one's been looking at that go, goes on with our voting, whole, our whole election system. And coming in as outsiders and starting to look at these things, just thinking we would fix the voting machine problem, because why would anybody even consider buying electronic voting machines with no paper? Um, we discover all kinds of other things going on. So this is a, an outline. I expect I'm not going to get through to every, through everything, but I'll just give you a rough idea of what I want to talk about. And you should interrupt me at any time, because I'm sure a lot of you have been following this issue closely, and there are cases where you know more about it than I do. So join in. You know, just interrupt. Uh, anyway, I want to talk about the basic different kinds of voting systems, testing and security. And I've got a special section for Diebold, which we all dearly love, um, because Diebold has just been a wonderful help in getting this, uh, this issue out. 
So a few horror stories, and I have more horror stories I can get, give you later if, if I don't give you enough this time. A little bit about uh, legislation and then how to steal an election is in parentheses because I don't think I'll get to that, but anybody who's interested in just getting a rough idea of how to steal an election, I've got some nice slides that I cribbed from someone else. Before I get on, go on with that, though, I was told that in Michigan, there's a, a, something which just came out, is that there are, there are um, ballots for absentee voters, and please correct me if I get this wrong, uh, that were printed up. And, and so these are like optical scan ballots where, you draw, where you, you draw a line between the name and the office. And apparently, one column was shifted, so there's nothing opposite Bush. I'm, right, nothing opposite Bush. Then you go down to Kerry, and there's the first thing. So in other words, it's skewed. So, so if you think you're voting for Kerry, you might actually vote for Bush. The same thing in uh, the songs, the same old story four years ago in Florida, right? That was the, 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 the butterfly ballot. Trick, so then it was an accident, right? This is deliberate. Songs uh, smells Bush a long way. Yeah, so they, they've been reprinted and mailed out, as I have been told. I mean, I just found this out a few minutes ago, so this is not something I knew. Uh, but what, I don't know what happens if somebody gets, you know, sends in one ballot and then gets a new ballot and sends that in. How do they decide which one to count? They count them both, do they throw them both away? I mean, this thing sounds like it's a real mess. And I have to say, for, for the life of me, I can't figure out how, I mean, how anyone could have let that go out, because that's such a glaring mistake that you have to wonder. By the way, the butterfly ballot was not legal, according to Florida law. And Teresa Lepore, who was a Democrat at the time she approved of it, had not been a Democrat before then and I think is not a Democrat now, in any case. OK, computerized voting machines. Do I have that story right, by the way? Yes? OK. So optical scans, uh, and we were just talking about an optical scan ballot. So you basically have paper ballots. Uh, the, this whole system is cheaper than getting electronic voting machines, touchscreen voting machines. You, by definition, have a voter verified paper ballot because the voter has to mark the ballot, so the voter has clearly verified the voter's choice because you see it, it's right there on the ballot. Uh, the kind of system which I believe one should have right now is an optical scan system with a precinct based scanner. And the idea is one of the problems with um, some of these optical scan systems is you can, first of all, you can have overvotes, which you'd make because you're not being careful, or you could have a straight pencil mark. Overvotes means, for example, two, p two votes for president, which makes your ballot illegal, at least for that office. So you want to make sure you don't have overvotes. Uh, undervote is if you don't vote for an, as many positions as you can, or you don't vote at all for position. So an optical, a, a precinct-based optical scanner can warn you if you've got something illegal on your ballot, if it, if it picks up an overvote. And it can also warn you if there's nothing on your ballot. You could fine tune them in theory, so they also warn you if you don't vote for particular offices. But as of now, I don't know of any optical scan readers that give that kind of feedback. But in principle, you could do it. The disadvantages are multilingual ballots can be a problem. And disa disabled, and by disabled, usually they're talking about blind voters can have problems with optical scan ballots. So now this, now something which I call screen-based systems, and this is not what the advocates for paperless machines, this is not the way they'll frame it, but I want to frame it as screen-based systems. So you have a screen-based system, you've got a, a computer screen, and you can have earphones for people with vision, vision impairment and literacy problems. These, of course, have multi-language multi capabilities. You can avoid overvotes by not allowing people to vote twice, say, for president. If you vote for one and then you vote for a second, it'll, it'll undo the first vote, so it won't let you do an overvote. It'll warn you of undervotes. Uh, you can modify your vote before you finally say, okay, finalize it. So you can go back and change it on the screen. And it satisfies HAVA requirements for disabled people. So one of the things that HAVA has written into it is that people have to be able to vote independently by 2006, that is to say blind people. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, why, why people are going out and buying all of these paperless touchscreen voting machines, because certain advocates say, this is what you've got to get for blind people. That's not true. You just have to have something that lets them vote independently. There are, there are other systems that are uh, available, which I like to call ballot marketing, marking and generating systems. So getting back to the whole optical scan uh, machine, you could, for example, make it possible for blind people to verify their votes if you had headphones attached to the reader, and then that reader will tell you what, what's on your ballot. That doesn't tell you how you mark the ballot, but you could verify the ballot. And then there are two systems uh, that are in the process of being certified. 
One is by a company called Vogue Election Systems, which is now being marketed by ES&S, which is one of the major, three, three major vendors. I'll get to that in a minute. And they make something called AutoMark. And the way the AutoMark works is you take a blank optical scan ballot and you insert it in the back of the machine. And then it's got a touch screen and you vote on the touch screen. If you're blind, you can have headphones. And you do it just the way you would with any touch screen voting. Except when you had cast my ballot, it does not record your ballot internally. It marks the optical scan ballot. And then you can take it and put it into a reader. And now you have a paper ballot. You can look at it and make sure it marked it correctly. Uh, if it doesn't, you can request another ballot. You can say there's a problem. So you can verify that your ballot was correctly marked, correctly recorded. And you can also run it through the reader to, 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 to at least check, double check on things. But in principle, it shouldn't make a mistake. It can prevent you from doing any overvotes because it behaves the same way any of these computerized, computer based voting machines behaves. It won't let you vote twice when, you can, when you're only allowed to vote once. Uh, there's also a company called Populux, which um, has a stylus. It has a screen, but you, you use a stylus to mark. And that actually prints out the ballot. Uh, but it was designed all along to print out the ballot. This isn't a retrofit. And when it prints out the ballot, uh, it prints out, I mean, this is not a perfect design, but it prints out the numbers for all the offices you voted for. So you can go back and look at the uh, original ballot and check to make sure it recorded things correctly. And it also prints out a barcode, which of course most people can't read, but which it makes the optical scanner less likely to make any mistakes. Um, and you can get people who can read barcodes and can go back and verify that there's no cheating on these ballots. Um, as I say, I think from a human factors perspective, it's not ideal, but you can verify your vote that it was recorded correctly, and you can check to make sure the barcode is not, is not wrong. I mean, and if it is wrong, you've got the numbers that have been verified. So the thing that's causing all the furor, or primarily causing the furor, so it's called direct recording electronic, or DRE. And these are the touchscreen, basic, most of them are touchscreen. One of them isn't, or maybe more than one. And they, generally speaking, do not have a voter verified or voter verified audit trail. So for example, in the case of California, where we have a law that mandates a 1% manual recount, 1% randomly selected precincts manually recounted. And that law was passed, by the way, when the optical scan machines came in as a check on them, because those sometimes make mistakes, too. And I'll get to that later. Um, what they do here in California is they print out the ballot images at the end of the day. And then they manually recount those to satisfy the law. So anyone who knows anything about computers knows they're just doing a memory dump, right? So you're going to see what's inside the computer all right. But you don't necessarily know that what was stored inside the computer was what you intended to vote. I mean, it, because you've got this gap between the, what's on the screen and what gets stored inside the computer. And you could certainly have malicious or buggy software that can change the vote. And you have no way to catch that by printing out the ballots at the end of the day. Uh, so these machines, there's no audit trail. Uh, and therefore, you really, really, really have to get it right if you're going to even use these things, which I don't think you should. But that's another, you know, hopefully I'll convince you of that too. So when these machines were sold to election officials, they were told, look how easy this is. At the end of the, you know, when the election's over, you push a button, you get all the tallies, you go home, basically. I mean, it's not quite that simple. But that's the idea. You don't have to do a recount because they don't make mistakes. Um, and it saves you lots of money. You don't have to print up ballots. You know, it's just a lot easier. And you can understand why this would be very appealing to people. But what they weren't told was you have to be very careful with the security of these machines, because these machines have software in them. So they have to be very securely stored prior to, during, and after elections. And they must be extensively tested. And I can tell you that very few of them are extensively tested. And in many cases, storage is not what, what, what it should be. Um, there's a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but I was told that a couple of years ago, well, during the California primary, I guess it was, uh, some, some Berkeley students volunteered their home as an election, as a precinct. And a week before the uh, election, all these machines were delivered to their house. Now, you know, we know that 
Berkeley students never cheat or do anything wrong, but um, in theory they could have, right? I mean, they could have gone. Now there are, there are these secure tags that are now being used to try to make sure that you can tell if somebody does anything uh, that they shouldn't be doing. But if you have a week and you know what the tags look like, and the tags are often numbered, but given what the stakes are, it seems to me there's a good chance that you could make some, you could go in there and fiddle with it. Now, admittedly, in that situation, the worst case scenario is that they would only be able to change a few machines. And of course, one of the problems when you've got these machines that all have the same software on them is if you can change the software at the source, you can have major impact. Anyway, as, as I say, the testing and security are grossly inadequate, and I'll get to that. So this is an old slide. When I originally wrote it, it I said all these machines are already purchased for over 20% of the US voters. It's now around 30%. So these paperless voting machines are going to be used by almost a third of the voters in the United States in 2004 election. Small number of vendors nationally. The software is secret. And independent computer security experts are not allowed to test or view the software. Sometimes the code is held in escrow, but that doesn't mean that you can look at it. Uh, now, there are a couple of DREs that produce paper ballots. Uh, one is called Avante, and it produces a paper ballot under, the gla under glass. So uh, when you finish voting, it, it sort of rolls out a paper ballot, and you can look at it. And, and verify it, but you can't touch it. And then it goes into a box. A uh, second one is called Acupol. And I should mention that Sequoia, which is one of the major manufacturers of DRE, has produced, ha has retrofitted their machines to produce a paper ballot uh, or paper audit trail. And they just used this recently in Nevada. Now, one of the problems with the Sequoia system is that they're printing it out on a roll. And so you have to worry about the whole privacy issue. Because if you know the order that people went to the polls, you might be able to be able to deduct, to, to, to figure out how people voted. So uh, just having these things printed out doesn't, isn't necessarily a panacea. You have to do it right. I mean, one of the problems with these machines is there's so many things that weren't done right and aren't being done right. And, and we just have to get them right. Uh, there are these things called feder uh, the Federal Election Commission standards. Um, there are two of them, 1990 and 2002. Most of the machines that are currently in use, the DREs, were certified to the earlier standard, the 1990 standard which is totally inadequate. And I can tell you the 2002 standard is inadequate also. Uh, but both of these machines did have paper ballot as their initial design. They're not retrofit. So the Avanti and the Acupol originally were designed to have paper ballots, whereas the Sequoia, which I just mentioned, uh, it's a retrofit. So um, you've probably heard the cry voter verified or voter verifiable ballots. Yeah. So the idea is the voter must be able to verify the ballot. It should be deposited in a secure ballot box. You cannot take it with you. So some people refer, especially people who don't like this, refer to them as receipts. And these are not receipts. Because receipts are illegal, for one thing. Because if you get a receipt for how you vote, you can take it out and sell your vote. So you don't want people to have receipts. You don't want them to leave the polling place. You might want a receipt showing you voted, but not how you voted. So you can't have a receipt which says how you voted. It's, it's a ballot, or it's an audit trail. I like to think of them as ballots because my feeling is if the voter has been able to verify it, it should be the final tally, not what's inside the computer. Um, there must be manual recounts of at least some percentage of the ballots, because otherwise you could print out paper ballots which accurately reflect your vote, and the machine has a different tally, and you'd have no way of knowing if you don't do some sort of check. So you have to be able to check these things. So you have to have some, some amount of manual recounts, hand recounts, that are done. And um, I don't know if 1% is the right figure. I don't know what the right figure should be. But 1% seems to me to be a minimal number that you should be recounting. And they should be randomly selected. Because if it's known beforehand which ones you're going to recount, and if you want to, if you want to do something with the election, you make sure those are accurate and you jimmy with the others. Um, so one of the problems that I think we've, we've, we've observed with elections since 2000, or maybe before, is that sometimes it's hard to get a recount. Some states make it almost impossible to get a recount. And so in addition to worrying about the technology, I think we also have to worry about some of the laws we have in this country, which are, some of which I think are quite archaic and are not designed to make things more democratic, to make things more transparent. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about internet voting because uh, of the history of Michigan. This is the only reason for having PowerPoint. Um, 
so um, as, as uh, Professor Rosmierski said, I was involved with a study of the Department of Defense project, which I'll get to in a minute. But I remember a couple of years ago, I was, I was speaking before a group of women uh, legislators, state legislators, and I made the remark in passing that internet voting would be a disaster. And afterwards, someone came up to me and said, I'm really surprised to hear you say that, because everyone's been telling us how wonderful it would be that it would be a way of increasing participation that all these young people who aren't voting now would go vote if we had internet voting. And I think that's still the view that a lot of people have. But if you think about it, internet voting is a much harder problem, for example, than electronic commerce. Because first of all, clearly, our democracy depends on vo upon voters believing and trusting the outcome of elections. The stakes are very high, as we've seen in this current election. I mean, people, huge amounts of money are being spent. So, if you're going to bribe someone, either for internet voting or for these paperless touchscreen machines, uh, the amount of money it would cost to give someone an extraordinarily handsome bribe to fix it <coughs> is, a, is a small fraction of the money that's being spent on the election. And of course, you've got this other issue about uh, who, who votes for whom and coercion. So even if it's not coercion, it's not OK for my husband to vote for me, even though I might not mind if he uses my credit card. Um, and if you have a denial of service attack, do you folks know what a denial of service attack is? It's basically when you can't get to a website or you can't get through on the internet. If you have a denial of service attack on voting, that can be a major problem because some people might not get a chance to vote. Whereas if you have a denial of service attack, say, on, an Am on the Amazon website, well, I'm sure Amazon's not happy if they lose sales. But those sales that got through are fine, and people can come back the next day and make the purchase if, or a few hours later. But with voting, there is no next day if you're voting on election day. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's really not the same. And then you've got this, this <coughs> ultimate problem, which is that voting is an anonymous activity. And electronic commerce in general is not. If I'm buying a book from Amazon.com, I want them to know who I am and precisely what book I'm buying. Whereas if I'm voting, I don't want you to know precisely how I'm voting. So it's, 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 a, it's a much harder problem. Furthermore, if there's a failure, like if I don't get my book from Amazon.com, you know, I know I haven't gotten it. And I can tell them I haven't gotten it. And generally speaking, they'll send me another book. But if my vote hasn't gotten recorded, or if it hasn't been recorded correctly, how do I know? There's no way to know. So it's just a much harder problem. And then you've got this issue of failure. So some people go around saying, well, you know, you'll fly on an airplane. So why don't you trust an airplane? So why don't you trust these voting machines? Well, of course, first of all, I don't mention this here, but the software that's used on airplanes, in fact, the software that's used on gambling machines in Las Vegas, is much more thoroughly tested than the software that's used on our voting machines. But also, you can detect failures. I mean, I don't want to think that if I fly on an airplane and it crashes, well, good people can detect failure. But the fact of the matter is that aviation has been made more secure because that does happen, and furthermore, we have, we have uh, an incident reporting mechanism in place for aviation, which we do not have for voting. There is no centralized incident reporting mechanism available. And, um, and so what do you do, for example, people are, some people who are worried about these machines say, well, let's have good exit polls. I mean, I'm all in favor of exit polls, but what do you do if you have good exit polls and the exit poll tallies do not match the, the numbers reported by the machines? What do you do? We have no mechanism for saying, OK, we've got to redo the election here or something like that. We just don't. Um, and then there are other major security problems with internet voting in particular, or well, in general, with any kind of computerized voting software bugs, which may or may not also be a security issue, or may or may not look like an insider attack, depending on what they do. Insider attacks. And insider attacks, uh, I think, are the most, in some ways, the hardest kinds of problems to deal with. Because, I mean, if you look, for example, at other forms of security, if you look at national security, the major incidents where national security has been compromised in this country for the past 15 or 20 years have, in, has in, have involved insiders, frequently highly placed insiders, who were trusted. And so how do you deal with that when you're, when you're dealing with voting machine, uh, voting, voting software? Uh, for internet voting, you have to worry about, about uh, the vulnerabilities of the client-side side voting equipment. So uh, if I'm voting on my computer, my computer could have some sort of virus in it. 
which can do who knows what. Maybe change my vote, whatever. Denial of service attacks, I've already mentioned. Automa automated vote, vote buying and selling is much, much easier to do on the internet. And a man in the middle of the attack, what man in the middle of the attack basically is there some, is that, there's, that you can basically position yourself between the voter and the place where the voting is occurring and perhaps see what, what the vote is, change it and so on, or sh shift it off someplace else. And for people who think that, well, we don't have to worry about that, I like this little example. I don't mean to pick on Microsoft, but this is just one, one example. I mean, anyone who's used PCs know that there are software fixes that go out all the time. Uh, there was a vulnerability in 2003, which would, have allowed, which would allow hackers to seize control of the machines, email, and so on. And uh, this sort of thing, if it went around on election day or during the election period, uh, could have a major impact on the outcome of an election. So this is the DOD um, voting system that was proposed. Uh, and the idea was that for the 04 elections, both primaries and the general election, uh, people would be able to vote you over the internet. Um, originally there were 10, so because voting is, is done at the, the legal, legal voting requirements are done at the state and local levels as opposed to national, basically each state had to decide if it was going to participate or not. And then within the state, localities had to decide if they were going to participate or not. So by the time we were finalizing our report, there were seven states and 50 counties in the total of those states who were going to participate. Um, and it would have allowed civil military a a anywhere and their families who were from those states or in localities to vote over the internet and also civilians from those states and localities living outside the country. And here's the, uh, the website. Uh, I don't know if they still have stuff up there or not. I haven't checked it recently where they had information. And by the way, I can always send people uh, slides so you don't have to write stuff down. And here are the system requirements that they had. Windows 95 or above, although I have a question mark because it wasn't clear if Windows 95 would have been adequate. By the way, it had to be a Windows machine. I couldn't have used my Mac. Um, MS Explorer 5.5 and above or Netscape Navigator 6.x through 7. The internet connections, dial-up modem, cable, and so on, you can see it, and you had to download an ActiveX component. The user was responsible for maintaining the security of their computers, could vote from anywhere. Public libraries, cyber cafes in Thailand, anywhere. So you can go in and vote from, from a cyber cafe. You don't know what's on that machine. There could be spyware on that machine, which is looking at what you vote and maybe changing it if it doesn't like it. Uh, so basically, we were going to have voting for a national election using proprietary, again, proprietary software, secret testing, insecure clients, and an insecure network. And that's basically what we said in our report. And much to our amazement, we released the report on the, tw report on the 21st of, of January. And on the 30th of January, we, learned, we, we heard, I mean, it was a few days afterwards that, it had, that we, we got the news. But on the 30th of January, Wolfowitz issued a memorandum saying kill serve. So it's not going to be used. Now, they were also behind schedule, too, so I don't know to what extent they were happy that we did our report. So these are some of our conclusions. Served contains all the security vulnerabilities of paperless touchscreen voting machines. Uh, Internet and PC-based made, made it vulnerable to potentially catastrophic well-known cyber attacks. And something that, again, I think a lot of uh, people who, who, who like the idea of Internet don't think about is that the attacks can come from anywhere, including other countries, including criminal elements, and so on. Uh, we really tried to think of some alternatives, maybe even doing registration online, and we felt everything we came up with seemed insecure. And of course, as this issue could appear to work flawlessly, and you know, have no way of knowing for sure if it did or didn't, but even if it did, then there's this danger that it would become widespread. And once you have widespread use of the internet, then there's uh, much more motivation for, doing something, for stealing the election. So. Um, we basically were very concerned that it would be used in 04 and things would appear to go fine. And people would say, great, let's continue. In fact, that's what Michigan did. So uh, how many here voted over the internet in the primary? Anyone? Yeah, you had to fill in paper and get in. in so it was sort of not entirely an internet pure thing. 
Did, did you ever, were you ever, were you able to verify that your vote was correctly recorded? Yeah. Right. So, of course, you don't have a secret ballot in the Michigan Democratic primary. So they could have actually done a testing, but they didn't. I got involved with the Michigan primary because um, at the 11th hour, there was an effort made to stop the internet voting. This was being uh, done, I forget the name of the man who was pushing it. His argument was that it discriminated against uh, minorities and poor people because they were less likely to be able to use the internet. So I happened to be in town when the DNC was holding hearings, and so I was given seven and a half minutes. Two of us were given a total of 15 minutes. I was the one talking about security. Seven and a half minutes to make the case that this was an insecure system to use. Um, seven and a half minutes, and then there was the head of the Michigan Democratic National Committee, the Michigan Democratic Committee came after me and uh, attempted to rebut everything I said, and I had no opportunity to respond, so we really didn't get much of a hearing. But I was, I was given documents beforehand that I looked at, and so the documents made the claim, internet voting is secure. And that's in black and white in these documents. Now, I happen to know it's not secure. But these are the kinds of claims that were being made. Um, now, as I mentioned here, there wasn't much motivation to steal this election, so I'm not claiming that there was any malfeasance or even anything wrong with what happened in the Michigan Democratic primaries internet vote. My concern was that by going ahead and doing this, people were getting the idea that it was a safe thing to do. And at one point, uh, Donna Brazil turned to me and said, well, do you think that the, sir, that the military one is secure? And I said, no, this is before a report came out. And uh, I think people were rather shocked by that because, of course, the CERV project was, being extent was at least being vetted. I don't know what this one was. I mean, I was given a document which talked about security and large chunks of it were redacted, so I couldn't even tell. Anyway, um, my favorite is what Missouri, North Dakota, and Utah are going to do. And I often start this talk by saying I like to give, tell jokes. I didn't do it this time because I knew I had this, I'd made this slide last night. Um, so Missouri, in its wisdom, is going to allow people in combat areas to vote um, using a combination of email and faxes. This was announced just a few weeks ago by the Secretary of State of Missouri, who is also the Republican candidate for governor. And what I'm telling you is what we've been able to figure out, but there is no documentation I've been able to see as to how this is going to work. It does not appear to have been adequately vetted by anybody on security grounds or any other grounds. So the idea is the voter will scan the, his or her ballot into the computer Oh, first you, you get a ballot. Oh, and by the way, they won't fax the, the apparently Missouri, some a lot of places do this, but Missouri does not fax the blank ballot to the voter, which would save a lot of time right there. So you have to get the ballot by mail, then you fill it in, then you scan it into the computer, and then you get this presumably PDF file, which you then email, I think over the, I, I believe it's over the military secure network, I'm pretty sure that's true, to some place in the DOD, the Pentagon, I think, where contractors will download the ballots, print them out, and fax them to the local election officials. OK, uh, anyone want to come up with some possibilities for fraud here? <laughs> no. I don't know what kind, what kind of, certainly no security review, no secret ballot. So the voters have to, so our, our troops who are defending democracy have to sign away their right to a secret ballot if they're going to use this me mechanism. Now coercion, of course, is always a concern. It's a concern with any kind of absentee ballot. But of course, the military having a fairly hierarchical structure, uh, you have to worry about it even more, in my opinion. I don't know of anything in place to observe the contractors. What could you do? Well. You can conveniently lose ballots you don't like, right? I mean, who will know? Um, now these ballots have signatures. You know, cut the signature. I think, I mean, you understand, I'm not, I, I don't hold me to specific details because we don't know exactly what this entails, but we do know you have to sign. You, you take the signature, you attach it to another ballot. <coughs> Remember these things are being, are being faxed and scanned, scanned a couple of times, get rid of any lines, mail that one in. 
or you can just conveniently add another vote, maybe for an office that hasn't been voted, or if you don't like the vote for a particular office, make it into an overvote so it doesn't count. Um, you know, those are just things off the top of my head. I mean, I'm sure there are other ways one could commit fraud here. So, I mean, I don't, and I don't know what you can do to stop it. I mean, it just to me, it's so, it's, as a computer scientist, it's just insane. Well, I mean, you think it's insane too, right? Yeah. Testing. By the way, join it, you, you know, say something if, no? Testing. So, one of the arguments for having secret software uh, is that it, it makes things more secure because the bad guys can't see the software so they don't know what the vulnerabilities are. And uh, it's sort of, um, I know, it's a fundamental rule in computer security that you have to assume the bad guys have access to everything and you still want it to be secure. In particular, to, to argue that keeping software secret gives you security is what's referred to as security through obscurity. And as you can tell from the name, people don't view it as a very, high, very, very highly as a, as a method of security. Um, one of the things, uh, those of you who followed uh, the, the crypto wars, the encryption wars will know that at one point there was an argument that the, in, that the encryption algorithm should be secure, that that would, the secret, that that would give more security. But ultimately what the government has decided is to make these algorithms all public. And in fact, the most recent uh, process for choosing a new encryption algorithm, new, new standard, was all public where everybody submitted their algorithms, people tried to break them and so on. And the feeling was that if people, very smart people try to break it and can't, then, then you have more confidence that it's secure. And that's sort of one of the fundamental principles of computer security. So this contradicts the basic notions of computer security. And there's a lack of uh, national, strong national standards for testing and security. Uh, now the testing is done, testing for these machines, electronic voting machines, is done by things called independent testing authorities or ITAs. There are three of them. They're private entities. The testing and the results are secret. They use test scripts. They test to the Federal Election Commission standards. I said there were two of them, 1990 and 2002. Uh, presumably now they're testing to the 2002 standards. Uh, it does not include what, uh, what computer scientists refer to as a code review. A code review is when you get a team and you sit down with the software and you go over line by line and you check to see if you go someplace what that does and, and then you double back. You, know, you, you want to understand the logic of the program. You want to make sure that you don't have any software there which you can't get to from anywhere. That's called dead code. Uh, that sort of thing isn't done because it's not part of the standards. So they, they basically have a checklist where they check, they test the standards. Now, a lot of things in the standards are reasonable. For example, um, for those of you who are computer, who've, who've done programming, they, 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 they require that subroutines have a single entry, single exit. Okay, that, that's not unreasonable. So you need a lot more than that. And in fact, one of the issues with computer security is that you can't just list a whole set of rules which guarantees security because if you could, we wouldn't have problems like the one I just pointed out from Microsoft in 2003. We wouldn't have all these software fixes that get sent out all the time. I mean, we basically cannot solve this problem. In general, we do the best we can. And the more effort you put into it, the more, the more time and effort and smart people you have working on it, presumably the more secure the system is. Um, with airplanes, again, there are lots and lots of rules with, with, with gambling machine, gambling machines, there are lots and lots of rules, but not with these voting machines. So in particular, you're going to test for the most likely problems, the most likely bugs. That means you're not very, you mean you're not very likely to find something which is very obscure because it's not likely. It's not in your list of things to test for. And yet, if you're going to undermine an election, if you're going to steal an election, what are you going to do? You're going to try to hide it. You're going to try to make it obscure. So a clever Trojan horse, in other words, malicious software that's been embedded in the software, is you're not very likely to find it. I can't say you won't find it, but it's not very likely, especially if you've got 50,000 lines of code, which is, not, which is what Diebold has in their, rig, in their, in their machine. Uh, now, again, if I were to write malicious software, to change an election, what I would do is I would make it behave in a random fashion. So I would, for example, if I wanted Bush to win, 
I would flip a coin and a certain number of times I'd look at the ballot. Sometimes I wouldn't even bother. And, if it, and I would just make sure that ballot said Bush. If it already said Bush, I wouldn't change it. If it said Kerry, I'd change it to Bush. And I'd flip it again, and a certain number of times I'd look at the ballot, and I would change it, I would make sure it said Kerry. But the number of times I would change to Kerry would be fewer than the number of times I would change to Bush. So that, so that there would be more votes shifted over. Now, if I do this randomly, it's possible someone might find there's a problem. You run the software again, it'll, it'll, it'll be different. It'll behave differently because it's random. It won't repeat the same process again. And again, those of us who've done debugging of software knows a bug that doesn't behave predictably tends to be harder to find. And sometimes you can't tell if it's a bug or if it's malicious code. And in fact, you might be able to write things cleverly enough so that it won't be obvious that it's, a, that it's a malicious code. I'm, that that would, could be difficult, but anyway, so that's testing. So uh, th I thought I'd talk about Ebold a little bit, but um, I don't have too much more time. I'm wondering, do people want to hear about Diebold? Are you interested in some of the Diebold Chronicles? So Diebold, Georgia, so, so some of these machines are being purchased statewide, some of them are being purchased lo locally. So in California, we have so some voting districts have DREs, some have optical scans. Uh, Georgia decided to go all with DREs and they purchased Diebold. And the 2002 Georgia election, all the races were, were held on Diebold machines. That's the race where uh, Max Cleland, who was an incumbent Democratic senator, lost. By the way, also the Democratic governor lost. Uh, the Cleland race was an upset. And it may very well have been completely accurate, but we have no way of knowing. There's nothing to recount because everything's electronic. There were no, uh, there's no paper audit trail. Um, one of the reasons why a lot of people are suspicious about Diebold is that the CEO of Diebold, um, I know he regrets it a lot, but he said he was involved with doing fundraising for Bush, and he said in a letter that went out that he was committed to helping Ohio deliver its electoral votes to the president next year. Um, Diebold is located in Ohio. And uh, there were also some emails, some, Diebold, some, some, some emails, somebody went in and got some emails uh, from people who were working in Diebold who were doing patches. Uh, uh, for the software, and that was posted on the website, and uh, a number of people had, had copies on their um, websites. Uh, so, some of them were Swarthmore students, undergraduates, uh, um, who posted on their website, and they received uh, threatening letters, a number of people did, from Diebold, threatening them under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, which basically, well, I won't go into the details of the DMCA, but basically they threatened them under the DMCA, which has both, both civil and criminal penalties uh, for certain types of uh, violation of copyright, uh, for posting these emails, which Diebold also disclaimed. So they're not their emails, but they were going after them anyway for copyright violation. Um, let's see, did I finish that? Right, okay. Um, somewhere I have a slide, because I, I, maybe it's, it's uh, later on, which tells what happened with those students. Uh, but let me first get on to this, and then if I don't, if I, I'll get back and tell you what happened. Um, so the Diebold saga really started when Bev Harris, who's been very active in fighting these paperless voting machines, discovered when she was just hanging, you know, perusing the net, uh, she discovered a whole bunch of Diebold files on the net. And she got some of these over to Avi Rubin, who was at Johns Hopkins, and he and um, um, three other people, two of, two of his students, and, and Dan, um, what's his last name? Uh, I think it was, anyway, well, a, a, someone who's a professor at, at Rice University, um, started looking at the software. And um, they came up with a whole bunch of problems. For example, they found that there was a an encryption key that was hardwired into the software, it was written into the software a single key. And if someone got a hold of this key, you could make major changes. Just one key. I mean, the same thing for everybody, for all machines. Uh, basically, Diebold didn't understand key management, which is a fundamental notion in computing. I mean, in, 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 in encryption, amazingly fundamental. And they'd been told about that five years earlier by someone named Doug Jones. Uh, so that's the kind of sloppiness that they had. And in fact, the fact that the software was on the website was another example of bad security. Um, some of the files were called Rob Georgia, which got people really upset that this was, because this is around the time of the uh, Georgia election. Uh, and 
the explanation was that there was this guy named Rob who was working on the Georgia file, and he happened to be up in Canada, and so he was doing things remotely, which is why they had it on the internet. Um, it was an open FTC website. So then after the Hopkins paper came out, which was just, just, just when Maryland had made this decision, the state of Maryland had decided to buy Diebold machines. They commissioned a company called SAIC to do another study of Diebold. And so SAIC produced a report, which uh, I urge you to read. It's very short because only about a third of it is public. <clears throat> Two thirds of it is redacted. Um, and Maryland went ahead and purchased the machines anyway. <clears throat> and then afterwards, they also had, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Raba, another company, have a red team go in and spend about a week trying to hack into the machines. And I was talking to someone who was on the, the red on the Raba team, and he said, Bill Arbach, he said, well. You know, my job was to try to break into the machine physically. And, you know, I spent a few minutes and got into it, and that was it. I was done. I didn't have to do anything the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> the Ohio Secretary of State had been considering buying Diebold, but because, actually, I think of one very uh, outspoken member of the legislature there, he didn't. Uh, he was originally going to buy it for the whole state. <clears throat> now, here's what the SAIC report, some, of the, some stuff about the SAIC report. Their entire Section 5, which is called Risk Assessment Findings, including a discussion of the SBE security requirements, blah, blah, blah. Basically, the risk assessment section was redacted. Now, um, even the title of that section was redacted in the index. But I, you know, not, not that I'm such a detective, but I was able to figure out what the title was because, you know, when they give the overview of the paper, they forgot to scratch out that title. So that part wasn't redacted. So it was easy to see what Section 5 was. Not to read Section 5, but to see what it was that they redacted. Uh, they also have, this is a direct quote from the report, the voting terminal is an embedded device running Microsoft Windows redacted as its operating system. Now, why would they redact the name of the operating system? Any ideas? Well, the reason is that it was Windows CE. Now, Windows CE is kind of a roll-your-own operating, uh, operating system. So it's, it, it, the idea is you take it and you, 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 you tweak it to fit particular devices. Now, I didn't mention this, but one of the issues with testing is that commercial off-the-shelf software is not tested because you can't look at the software, right? So it gets a blanket exemption. Now, when you test the whole the system, you, you're running the commercial off-the-shelf software in that system when you're testing. But nobody goes and examines, say, the Windows operating system to see if there's any malicious code in there. So that's not looked at at all. Now, so the idea is that Windows CE is a commercial off-the-shelf software. It doesn't have to be looked at. But the fact of the matter is that Diebold went in and made changes to it because that's what you do. I mean, I'm not condemning Diebold for it. That's the nature of Windows CE. So the theory is that the reason they redacted the name of the operating system is they didn't want to make the obvious point that this is an operating system where changes have been made and no one is looking at it. The currently used version of the AccuVote TS, that's the name of the, uh, the, the default system software, is redacted, written in C++. I don't know why that was redacted. And then the Raba team, which I say was the third study, there was the Avi, Avi Rubin et al. study, the, the um, SAIC study, and then the Raba trying to break in, um, found pure, poor security, and then I, there's a nice quote from uh, Bill Arbach saying, I can say with confidence that nobody looked at the system with an eye to security who understands security. And this is after these other reports had come out, and they presumably made changes. And Maryland now has a system where there are 16 Windows security patches. So they're using Windows for their counting program. Their counting program is used by their optical scan machines as well as their touchscreen machines. Their counting program has, 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 has basically Windows software in it, 16 security patches. They can't install them because it makes the machine crash. So uh, quoting Michael Wertheimer, who was also in the Raba study, who testified at a recent court case trying to force Maryland to provide paper ballots. It was thrown out by the courts. But anyway, uh, at least the, the injunction was thrown out. Uh, essentially, you have a system that must be insecure in order to function. And then I mentioned the Diebold emails. OK, here's where I get to what happened to the Swarthmore students. Um, Diebold, when, when EFF and Stanford Law Clinic sort of stood up to Diebold's threat, Diebold withdrew its threat. But then the Swarthmore students uh, made, you know, brought their own suit. And they just won in September 
uh, they basically claimed, and the courts agreed with them, that Diebold knowingly misrepresented <coughs> copyright claims. So now Diebold has to pay court costs, which is going to amount to a few thousand dollars. It's not a great deal. In California, uh, the Secretary of State <coughs> discovered that... Um, Can I ask, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, go into a little more detail there as to what the copyright violation was that Diebold felt it was uh, asserted under DMCA. I'm not sure of the details, although the person behind the camera here might know because I think he did something similar uh, in terms of putting the software on his system, I mean, the, the emails on his system. Um, but the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, makes it illegal to circumvent any kind of copyright protection mechanism. And I think that they felt that by breaking into the system, they were that there were, they, had some, they may have had some kind of protection there that you, they were circumventing it, and that was why they would be held to DMCA. Uh, requirements knows that. Do I have that one correct? You know? I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. So the courts found that they didn't have that claim. The courts found that Diebold's copyright claim was not valid. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why I haven't read the decision. Okay. Does anybody else know? Anybody in class know more detail on that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so California Secretary of State Kevin Shelley discovered that um, all the Diebold system voting machine software used in California was not certified by the state. So I should mention with certification there are these federal certification, uh, federal certification that, that's done with, to these FEC standards. Some states also have their own state certification. California is one of them. So um, he got pretty upset because he'd been told that it was certified. Uh, I'm sorry, he, uh, he, yeah, he got upset about that, and then he was also told that uh, particular Diebold TSX was federally certified and it wasn't. So what Shelley did was he conditionally decertified all Diebold TS, all DREs, excuse me, decertified all DREs conditionally. And then he had a set of requirements that they, companies had to fulfill to get temporarily recertified. But he, he just ruled out Diebold TSXs completely. He said, no, absolutely not. These are illegal to use in California. Um, obviously, some of the, 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 the areas where these have been purchased, the election officials were not happy. In one case, I think it was Solano County, they actually were able to return the machines. Uh, some of the elect, local the election officials uh, to, uh, sued Shelley, but it was thrown out of court. Uh, and now California is suing Diebold on charges of defrauding the state with false claims about its products. Uh, that suit was started about six months ago by some local activists, and the Attorney General recently announced that, that California was joining in on the suit. I should also mention, just so for those of you who are uh, political junkies, uh, Shelley, there's, I don't know if you get this here, but in California there's been a lot of news about Shelley and election contributions and misusing HAVA fund and so on. So Shelley's in the hot seat right now, unfortunately. He had been sort of a leader in the country in, fighting, in, 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 in holding these DREs, uh, making them accountable. So he's mandated that by 2006, all voting machines in California must produce voter verifiable audit trails, paper audit trails, and all new ones by 05. And in fact, there was just a law passed by the California legislature and signed, signed by Schwarzenegger, which says the same thing. But Shelley's in trouble, and uh, you know, it sounds to me like he made some bad decisions, did some bad things maybe, but I also suspect that one of the reasons this was uncovered was that uh, there were some companies that didn't like seeing him there. Horror stories. Okay. Boone County, Illinois, I rather like this one. The initial election results showed over 144,000 ballots were cast in a county with fewer than 19,000 registered voters. Only 5,532 actually voted. Uh, the county clerk said it was a glitch in the software. Now, glitch is a word that gets used a lot. Now, but this, what we're not talking about is glitch. I mean, I, I really hate it when they say glitch because it makes it sound like it's no big deal. But this is a big deal. We're talking about our vote here and who gets to run the country. So it was a glitch in the software. Um, they fixed it, so everything's OK, except we have no way of knowing if they fixed it right. Yeah. Hine County, Mississippi, the DREs were down in the morning, problems all day, no paper ballot alternatives. Voters had to wait in long lines, wrote makeshift paper ballots, inadequate privacy, still in lines at 8 PM. And the Mississippi State Senate actually declared the results invalid, and new election was held. 
Now, had there been paper ballots available, at least as an alternative, this, they could have avoided this whole thing. And getting back again to California, another thing that Shelley mandated was that for the 04 election, paper ballots must be provided for people who don't want to vote on these machines. And I just uh, signed up to be an election official, <laughs> so I figured I should get, get some hands-on experience. And I went to class, and I was told in class that we're not allowed to tell people that they have this option. And I said, excuse me, why aren't we allowed to tell them? He said, well, it's a law. So I said, would you please check that? And she checked that it wasn't the law. Then she said, well, it was something that Shelley said. It turns out it wasn't something that Shelley said. Basically, you get a lot of resistance on the part of election officials. They don't want people doing this. And so they're actually going out and telling, at least in the case of the class that I went to, and I'm sure this is happening throughout Santa Clara County, that people are being told you cannot volunteer this information. And in fact, that's not true. Broward County. Uh, gee, I forget where that, I think it's, oh, it's Florida, of course. Um, there was a special election uh, held with only to fill one house seat. That's all it was for. It was for nothing else. A special election for one house seat. 134 people used the ESNS DREs, didn't cast any ballots whatsoever. Um, the winning candidate won by 12 votes. Now, Florida has a law mandating a recount if the election was within a certain percentage. And it was here. But there was no recount held because there was nothing to recount. The idea is to recount is to go back and look at the ballots that were presumably not voted, but there's no way they could look at them because they weren't there. Uh, Baton Rouge mayor, mayor race in 2002. The former mayor, Emile Dassieu, came in third. It was 8% undervote. Low numbers reported in his home precinct. Now it turns out. Well, first of all, Sequoia sold the system with trade secret protection. They all do. And that's why you can't, they, they won't really reveal the, fel the, 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 the software because it'd be a felony. Um, turns out, when they did testing for this machine, they only tested the first place on the ballot. This guy was third on the ballot. So there's no testing done to see if, 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 if votes were recorded for every single place on the ballot. And then after the election, um, they changed, they, 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 they took it out of voting mode, and you couldn't go back and do the testing. Um, so, legislation. Rush Holt uh, has had legislation in the House of Representatives for quite a while. Obviously, it's not going anywhere this year, um, called H.R. 2239, and he wants to mandate a voter verified paper ballot. Uh, and he also wanted to mandate a, a half a percent manual recount for all elections and forbid the use of undisclosed software. Uh, also banning wireless communication devices. You'd think this would be obvious, but it's not. Uh, anyway, um, these are, this is what the, the legislation says. It's not going to pass. There were some bill. There were some bills introduced in the Senate. Graham introduced a bill called S1980, which was basically this bill. Uh, there were a couple of other bills that were, that were introduced. Uh, Hillary Clinton had a bill, Barbara Boxer had a bill, um, but none of them is going anywhere. So ACM, which is not as big as IEEE, um, issued a voting sta a statement on e-voting. And uh, I, I co-chaired the US Public Policy Committee of ACM. We had taken a position on e-voting quite a while ago, calling for voter verifiable paper, paper trail. But this is ACM, this is the parent organization, so it's a big deal for ACM to issue a statement, for those of you who are members of ACM here. Uh, but in fact, there was actually a survey done on the web uh, where the statement was posted, and of the number of the members who responded, uh, over 95% agreed with the statement, basically saying that uh, there should be some sort of physical record for voters. Uh, and of those who were not in that 95%, over 95%, most of them complained about the fact that the statement only talked about security and didn't talk about human factors. Now, human factors, which I haven't talked about, is another important issue. The whole butterfly ballot issue, in fact, this Michigan ballot, it's a human factors thing. If somebody can easily, you, you don't want it to, easy, to be easy for people to make mistakes. You want it to be easy for people to do what they intend to do. And human factors is a very important thing. The whole design of the ballot, the whole way the system, these machines work is very important. Uh, and I can understand people's concern about that, but we also were trying to keep it to a single issue. Anyway, what you can do, um, David Dill, who's a computer scientist at Stanford, uh, has been very active in this, and he has a website, verifiedvoting.org. Uh, this, this slide is way out of date. The petition has over 
2,000 technical people have signed it, and then there, there are also signatures for other people, for attorneys, for election officials, for um, anybody to sign uh, calling for voter, verifi voter verifiable audit trail. Um, and then you can go to the US ACM website and see what we have done, and then there's the ACM statement. So I think, yeah, okay, I think it's probably a good place to stop. In fact, I've gone over. Let's, uh, let's take questions from the audience. Anybody have any? Okay, I have a question. Here's, here's one of the back experts. Go ahead. Um, uh, recently, I had a, uh, most of the uh, concern has been about uh, security, and I had a, a more basic question, which is just about machines functioning. And I had two ATM experiences recently, a couple years ago. My branch, uh, the bank replaced the branch ATMs with new robust ATMs that are touch screen and have all of that. And one time, one of the machines doesn't, sometimes has trouble. Uh, and I think it's a hardware part of it. And I remember trying to find the button and get it to work, and it didn't work, and I kept on trying to get it to work. And it ended up taking out three times more money. I found it three times. So there was a counter somewhere in the software that counted it up three times. Printed out the receipt, told me I'd taken out three times as much money. But that this was not malicious, it wasn't intentional, right. it just right. was a you know, mess. It's just a <laughs> hardware thing, and, and sometimes the buttons don't work. And I just envision all of these machines going into all of these precincts. And if they don't work, the precinct workers, it's not their fault. They're just lost. It, it's not going to know what to do. If you have a big election like we may have you know, next month, there's going to be those huge lines of people. And if the machines don't work, it's a huge disaster. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why I think we should have paper ballots there, too, for people to use. Um, but um, I think there are going to be a lot of court cases after November 2nd. Uh, not only, I don't know, what at the presidential level, but I think also at other levels, because when people lose on these machines, they're going to be upset. Um, there's another thing I didn't get into, this thing called the ballot definition files. And ballot definition files are, um, and this is an issue for optical scan machines and for <coughs> DREs. So you, you don't know who the candidates are until relatively close to the election, presumably. And so, especially if you've got a screen-based machine, but this is also an issue for optical scans, You've got to put down who the candidates are. With the screen, you've got, to, you've got to say, you've got to have a way to link when someone votes for Kerry or Bush, to link that vote to the counter inside the computer correctly. And with optical scans, when you put them through, you've got the same issue. Where you've got to read what's on the ballot, you've got to get it linked inside the computer to the place where these, ballot, these, these, these candidates are being counted. And in fact, some of you may remember, uh, there was a primary uh, after Kerry was already the obvious winner where Gephardt received a lot of votes, he'd already, uh, I think, withdrawn from the race. It was probably in Missouri. <coughs> and uh, it was an optical scan machine. And so people were able to go back and look at the paper ballots and realize that this thing had been programmed wrong. I, I don't think, again, I don't think it was malicious uh, that, that, that votes for Kerry were being credited to Gephardt. Now, because there, was, there were paper ballots, when people saw an anomaly, they were able to go back and look and say, wait a minute, what's going on here, and figure it out. But if there are no paper ballots, if you've just got electrons, how do you do it? And, and of course, what do you do if it's not an obvious anomaly? I mean, you know, what if Nader gets a lot of votes somewhere? Are those really Nader votes? Are they really votes intended for Kerry? Are they votes intended for Bush? You know, there are ways you can mask cheating that, won't, that will not be so obvious as with the Gephardt vote. Question up here. Well, yes, when Congress passed the law and, and threw $4 billion into it, right. uh, didn't they also come up with specifications of what is expected, required, uh, or else? Uh, I mean, it seems like it's uh, sort of the Halliburton mentality of sorts. Uh. Well, NIST was supposed to come up with specifications. And that's not unreasonable. I mean, you don't, I think it, 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 I'm, I mean, I don't think it would have been appropriate for, con for Congress to come up with it because some of these are technical specifications. I mean, some of what you want. And Congress is not necessarily technical. So you want people who can take time and study the problem to come up with specifications. So having NIST come up with specifications was probably a reasonable thing to do. But then it wasn't, NIST wasn't funded. Now, I should mention something else. There's, um, there's a standards committee called P1583, which is being run by IEEE, which is coming up with standards for uh, electronic voting machines. That committee initially was pretty much controlled by the vendors. Some of us have gotten involved with it since and we're, we're trying very hard to make the standards reasonable. I think that these are the standards that are going to be adopted by the EAC, the Election Assistance Commission, Election Assurance Commission, I forget what the A stands for, which is basically, it was also 
put in, which was created by HAVA to oversee elections. Um, they, don't have mu they don't have funding either. They don't have adequate funding. Uh, uh, DeForest Soares is the chair of the EAC, and I think that his heart is really in the right place. I think he's really trying to do the right thing. But you know, the, these IEEE standards are going to come along, and they're just probably going to be adopted. Barbara, yeah. let me do a follow-up on that for a second. So if uh, NIST didn't receive any funding, did NIST play any role in trying to involve and engage the professional associations? Professional associations, aside from IEEE, which was written into HAVA, they were actually given a seat on one of the committees. It was written into HAVA. I, don't, I guess they've got good lobbyists in Washington. Um, so aside from IEEE's involvement, both in the standards and with this HAVA seat, no, I mean, certainly ACM has not been involved. The only involvement we had was when there were hearings held before HAVA was passed, we were able to get a slot for Rebecca Mercury to testify uh, before one of the committees, uh, although she did not officially testify for USACM. She testified only for herself. Uh, but aside from that, we have not really been involved. So what did NIST do? I don't think they've been able to do much. I mean, they, you know, they weren't happy. They weren't happy. They didn't no. get funded. No. And so they really haven't taken the leadership no. in getting this to happen. I mean, how could they have the resource? Yes. From what I heard at the Night Public Conference, the people in the committee had a really hard time, like the experts in, in security had a really hard time getting onto that committee for some, you know, mystical reason. Are you going to be hanging out afterwards? I can tell you more about it. Because it was dominated probably by vendors. There have been a lot of um, bizarre things happening. Okay, here's one. John? Presumably from people's perspective, they, they employ computer scientists. What's, what's their motivation for designing the system the way they did? Is it radically cheaper to do it that way? To design a system that doesn't work? I mean, I'm trying to understand from, <laughs> from people's perspective. What makes them... I have no idea who they employed. But they certainly didn't employ security experts. I think that's pretty clear. But one of the motivations was to get the machines out fast. Right. And right. so there really wasn't a motivation to put them at the best standard. It was to produce them and get them into the hands to get the contract. Right. So the development of electronic voting machine just pick up right after 2000? Well, there have been some that have been used for a long time. I understand Indiana, for example, has had people, at least had, not Diebold, but some other company, some Indiana company. Um, I mean, uh, some of these machines have been around for a while. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily secure, but they have been around for a while. Um, but there are sort of, they're, 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 there's the big three or the big four. There's Diebold, ES, and S and Sequoia are the big three, and then there's Hard InterCivic, sort of the fourth one. And those are the major vendors. And um, it's sort of so the interest of the history, actually, at one, so Diebold, I, I actually wrote a paper on the site, which, uh, I can give, um, send people a copy of it. I, sh I have a copy of it in my uh, briefcase over there. So I don't remember all the details. But basically, until recently, the head of the Diebold computing, uh, a voting su subsidiary, because, of course, Diebold's main, main product is ATMs. So they got into the voting business relatively recently. So the head of it, so they purchased another company. And that's sort of how they got into it. So the head of their voting subsidiary, uh, is, was the brother, I mean, they're still brothers, but they're not in these positions anymore, of, I think, the vice president of ES&S. And, and, um, and so these two men basically were at very high level positions for about two-thirds of the voting machines in the country. Looks like you came up with something. Did you want to make a comment? No, no, I was actually just going to mention that. Um, I read that today. Daily, I think. About the relationship. Oh, please. It's not that it's a real reliable source of information. <laughs> <laughs> I could get this, this. I mean, I have it on this paper. I just don't remember the details. Right, no, but the, the fact that um, they are brothers. Well, they're, they're, they've both since stepped down. Very high level. Uh, within the past couple of months, they've both stepped down, and I don't know why. My guess is because there's, you know, people have been going around saying, hey, this isn't right, this isn't right. Other? Yes. In terms of the coming election, are there any trends or things that you're really watching for that will be assigned to you that something has gone wrong? Well, I'm sure things will go wrong because things have been going wrong every time these machines are used in large quantities. Uh, so things will go wrong, I think. I mean, I think it's a pretty safe bet things will go wrong. Um, I don't know. I mean, like when you get 144,000 votes and... I mean, that's kind of obvious. In your field are expecting? 
Well, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, again, if you, what do you do if you get, say, exit polls which say the number should be this and the machines report that, which is not the same? Does that mean something's gone wrong? I don't know. Maybe people weren't being honest with the exit polls. How do you, what do you do? I don't know. With, without the audit, it's not possible to, to detect patterns. Yeah. Yes. I would suggest that in all the computer, everything goes wrong. There's nothing right about this whole thing. This is for a whole hour. Nothing is right with this computer. And it's fraud, it's wide open. Why don't we just go back to the old fashioned with a paper, put the mark on, this is the line that I want, this man, and then put it in the mail in the box or take it to the clerk's office and get the receipt that you have voted with the number on and then well, now what it and leave it for that for each state, each community, and that's what they do in Europe, the old fashioned way and they don't have a problem. So well it's wide open for just more business then it is working. Well, I got sort of two responses to that. First of all, with paper ballots, we've had election fraud too. And in fact, if you have Michael Seamus here to speak, most of his talk will be how bad paper ballots are. I mean, I happen to disagree with him, but you can't have fraud with paper ballots, for sure. We have. Which one is worse than the other? Well, so I think one issue is, with paper ballots, uh, you can definitely have fraud. Ballot, I mean, ballot boxes were found flooding in San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago. I mean, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, but I sort of view this as a difference between wholesale and retail fraud. So with paper ballots, paper ballot, you know, they, elections have been rigged using paper ballots, probably since paper ballots started being used. But if you're going to go and rig an election, you know, you've got to deal with the actual ballot boxes. You, you've got to get more people involved. It's more of, um, it's more of a, you know, on the scene kind of thing. So you, you have more people involved, so the greater risk of being caught. You know, you can only influence so many because of the physical, you know, because you're dealing with physical items. Whereas if you're dealing with software, if you can go and change the code for the deep old TX machines, those are widely used. You know, Change the software in that, you can impact elections in California. I, I, I think that's what's used in, you know, maybe in Georgia and Maryland, depending on you know, Ohio, I mean, wherever these particular, particular brands of Diebold machines are being used. So that's, that's like wholesale fraud as opposed to retail. So I see the paper ballots as retail fraud, the, the voting machines as potential wholesale fraud. Plus, with the voting machines, as I say, again, it's optical scan, you have to worry about this too. You have what's probably much more likely, at least up till now, is bugs. I mean, I don't know if there's been any fraud. Maybe there has, maybe there hasn't. I don't know. But I sure know there have been bugs. Because we have evidence of the fact that there have been bugs. So, um, so. Which one has the most uh, lost our votes of the two systems? Well, as I say, with paper, you know, you've got this additional problem with software that you can have software bugs which can, which can change, or, you know, ballot definition files which can record votes incorrectly. And that's not an issue with paper ballots. You have other issues with paper ballots, but you don't have that. And the fact of the matter is we don't have a, any perfect system. I mean, I, as I say, I like the, opti I like the optical scan-based systems. But if you don't do some sort of check on those machines, you can rig those too. Uh, so you have to do some kind of manual recount for anything. People don't like hearing that because no one wants to do it. But you, I think you have to do some kind of manual recount, at least of some percentage of the ballots. And, uh, you know, maybe, I don't think we'll ever have a perfect system, but what we should be doing is trying to design systems that are harder to, you know, that are more secure, harder to rig, as opposed to less secure. I mean, that's how I, that's my main complaint is I think we're going the wrong way with these machines. We should be, security should be a number one, security and then usability should be the major issues for these machines, and we should be working to make them more secure. And instead of having these machines which are, I mean, I think all these DREs should be thrown in the trash heap myself. I mean, I think election officials should be, should be trying to get their money back on the grounds that they were sold faulty products. One of the problems is that, you know, they, they believe these, these vendors. Let's take uh, two more questions from, uh, well, let's take them first from non-class <coughs> participants, okay, because the class uh, will have a chance to ask questions of Barbara later. Others that are not in uh, the 728 class, 
Yes. I'm curious about the bills you were saying aren't going anywhere in Congress. Yeah. Um, is that because someone is expecting to benefit from having faulty voting machines? I certainly can't say that. Um, I think I think it's mainly politics. Well, first of all, of course, Congress is about to close down. That's why I said it's not going anywhere. Given given the time, I don't think anything's going anywhere. Uh, they can't even get a budget passed. Um, but uh, I was told that the Republicans in Congress didn't want this coming up right now. I mean, there are Republicans who have signed on to the whole bill. Not many, but there are some. Um, and there are certainly Republicans I know who are actively working uh, to try to get paper ballots in, you know, voter verified audit trails or paper ballots. So, and, and I think it would be a disaster to make this a Democratic versus Republican issue. I think that would be an absolute disaster. And fortunately, it hasn't happened. But what I was told was that, that, some of the, Repu that the Republican leadership doesn't want this opened up right now because they don't want to raise any questions about the election. So. Any other questions? Yes, I'd like to have more details about absentee ballots. How safe is that? Well, absentee ballots have traditionally been a, a source for fraud. Um, by the way, I just signed up for a permanent absentee ballot a few months ago because we have touchscreen voting machines where I live, and I'm not going to vote. I voted for the, on the recall on, what, on it to see what it was like, and I'm going to be running them in November 2nd, but I'm not going to vote on them. So I have a permanent absentee ballot, but um, traditionally absentee ballots have been a problem. It depends on the state. Some states, I understand, don't even count them unless they, they could make a difference in the election. Some states do. Uh, you've got a privacy issue with absentee ballots. You've got coercion issue with absentee ballots, right? Or you, know, you can have situations where, for example, um, somebody works at a retirement home and requests absentee ballots for all the people there and then fills them out. Uh, so that's a kind of fraud. Um, one of the things you can do in California with absentee ballots, and my guess is you can do it here, but I don't know how things work in Michigan. By the way, one of the interesting things about doing this work is that there's so much to know, and there's so much I don't know. I mean, you know, I just keep on learning things. Like, I just learned about the this, this situation in Michigan today. Uh, but I, I'm going to hand carry my absentee ballot to the place where I'm serving, where I'm, where I'm an election official and deposit it there, because you can do that in California. You can deposit it anywhere. And um, so, you, you know, I would, you might want to hand carry it in, perhaps. I mean, I know that a lot of people are being encouraged to vote absentee where there are these touchscreen machines so that there will be a paper trail. So whereas on the one hand, absentee ballots have been a source of fraud, on the other hand, I mean, I would rather vote absentee than vote on a touchscreen machine with no paper. You should take it yourself to the clerk's office. Will you be safe doing that? Well, I'm just going to deposit it in the precinct where I'm working. But it's not, it's a, it depends on the state. I mean, I don't know, does Michigan have much of a history of fraud? I should think Michigan would be relatively... There were three, um, three of them in Michigan, I think, in 2003. I don't know what it's like here. And I don't know how they count absentee. In California, you take your absentee ballot and you, you, you have to sign it. I'm sorry. You take your absentee ballot, you put it into an envelope. And then you take that envelope and you put it into another envelope. And then you sign that outside envelope so that they can check you on the voting roll. The same thing in Michigan. And then they're supposed to, what they're supposed to do is to have two processes. They, 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 they open the outside envelope and then they put, take the other envelope and they put it somewhere else. And then later on they open the other envelope so that they can't link you to your vote. Um, done properly, I think it's, it's, it's not bad. I mean, I'm not saying there's going to be fraud with absentee ballots. I'm just saying that, that absentee ballots are not a perfect solution either. But I prefer it to these paperless machines. But you know, you have I'd to work. I'd like to uh, uh, call this to a close now and invite people to have um, refreshments in the back of the room and class uh, take a break. And I think we're going to stay right in this room uh, rather than go back to our classroom, OK? So let's take uh, a break, give Barbara a chance to relax. Thank you. Take this thing off. Are you still?